Welcome to another podcast where we discuss updates on COVID-19 and cardiometabolic disease brought to you by the Cardiometabolic Health Congress. I am Shpatim Karandria, the Scientific Director for CMHC, and uh, today I have the pleasure of speaking to CMHC's Senior Planning Committee member, Dr. Clyde Yancey. Dr. Yancey is Professor of Medicine and Chief of Cardiology at Northwestern University in Chicago and a nationally and internationally recognized expert in several areas of cardiology. And today we'll discuss COVID-19 and cardiovascular disease. Dr. Yancey, thank you for joining us today. And based on what we know now, what is the connection between cardiovascular disease and COVID-19? These are important issues for us to consider. I don't think there's a single individual in all of healthcare, in all of the lay community, who hasn't been overwhelmed by the crisis that is upon us with COVID-19. As time has evolved, we've realized that COVID-19 is not just a virus that causes bilateral pneumonitis and potential ARDS and can have fatal outcomes. But now we're learning that there is a profile that represents those patients in whom the consequences of COVID-19 may be substantially worse. Specifically, we are becoming aware that patients that already have pre-existing cardiovascular disease, either coronary disease or heart failure, plus hypertension or diabetes, are at unique risk for complications of COVID-19 infection. That is further exacerbated when we discover evidence of myocardial injury. So where we were just several weeks ago versus where we are now is in a much more informed position recognizing that there is an increased risk for those with cardiovascular disease and an exaggerated risk in the setting of myocardial injury. Do we know if COVID-19 can cause cardiac injury? So as we begin to try to understand what is the genesis, or better put, what is the biology that uniquely puts patients with underlying cardiovascular disease at risk for myocardial injury, one of the plausible hypotheses is that COVID-19 perhaps may have a predilection for the cardiovascular system and lead to cardiac injury. Specifically, that would be manifest as myocarditis. It turns out that other than a few case reports, we don't have a consistent signal that myocarditis is exactly the phenomenon that's occurring. We do, however, see the elaboration of evidence of injury in some recently published series from Wuhan province, China, So be aware of that particular patient population, patient population with a high incidence of pre-existing cardiovascular disease. About 20% of the patients in the Wuhan province upon which the report was generated had evidence of cardiac injury defined by the presence of troponins. Does that, in fact, mean that it was a myocardial infarction? No. Does that mean it might have been myocarditis? Not sufficiently compelling evidence but myocardial injury does appear to be the case. Point being is that there's still more we have to learn. There are some case reports based predominantly on non-invasive data, echo and MRI, that argue that we have seen myocarditis, but we can't say yet that that's a consistent pattern of injury. And there's been a lot of confusion lately about discontinuing ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers due to the increased risk or perceived increased risk of COVID-19. And I want to ask, what started all of this, where do we stand now, and what is your message to our audience? So that is a very appropriate question, and it's generating a lot of angst, not only in the medical community, but in the lay community. The drugs that we use to treat hypertension and heart failure very much constitute the use of ARBs and ACE inhibitors in some circumstances as model therapy. And so there are a number of people measured likely in the millions that are exposed to these agents and are concerned that the therapies that have been appropriately prescribed for heart failure or hypertension may put them at risk for COVID-19 infection. Here's what we understand from our virology colleagues. For some time now, we've understood that the SARS viruses, severe acute respiratory distress syndrome viruses, do achieve cellular entry via the ACE2 pathway. Now, pause for a moment. The ACE2 pathway is not the same pathway that we typically manipulate in the treatment of cardiovascular disease. In fact, it's a counter-regulatory pathway that has countervailing actions against 
the deleterious consequences of angiotensin II production. So ostensibly, having increased ACE2 is a good thing, antifibrotic, anti-growth, lowers blood pressure. But there is some evidence that it facilitates entry of the SARS-like viruses into the epithelial cells. And we know that ACE inhibitors and ARBs not only have varying effects on ACE2 levels, but between the two drugs, there may be a varying effect. Point being is that there's not a consistent biology that we can refer to. And even more importantly, there is not yet a reliable case series or certainly not a randomized trial that says for certain either taking ACE inhibitors or ARBs puts you at risk or conversely, taking ACE inhibitors or ARBs protects you from risk. There, in fact, there's some animal data looking at ARBs and arguing that the ARBs might prevent the lung injury. I've given you a fairly elaborate answer specifically to get to one point. We simply don't have enough information to go against the wealth of data that demonstrates the benefit of ARBs and ACE inhibitors when appropriately prescribed for the correct indication. Certainly, this is a conversation a patient should have with their physician. Is the risk of discontinuing therapy out of fear of COVID-19 uh, more important than the benefit of staying on therapy and avoiding an exacerbation of either heart failure or hypertension? Those are very much um, important conversations that need to be had with the providers. But all of the organizations of record, the Heart Failure Society of America, the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, have come out strongly in favor of continuing the current therapies for heart failure and, and hypertension, and I completely align with institutions of which I'm a member that have appropriately stepped up and taken the high road here and said, let's stick with the evidence and stay with what works for the conditions that we know you have. Lastly, a lot has been made lately about the potential of chloroquine and chloroquine-based therapies for the treatment of COVID-19, and much of it based on smaller scale or even anecdotal evidence. However, since these drugs are known to be associated with uh, cardiac complications, with QT prolongation being one of them, for example, should any monitoring take place for these potential adverse events? So to be perfectly clear, no patient should be exposed to an investigational or empiric therapy for COVID-19 infections and its consequences without being part of a very regimented, appropriately configured data capturing effort, an observational registry, a randomized trial, a trial within the registry. But to adopt a therapy like hydroxychloroquine or any other such therapy, an antiviral, um, based solely on empiricism. Um, some people are describing these as Hail Mary efforts. I understand the emotion. I understand the angst. My own hospital is deeply involved in treating patients with COVID-19 and the consequences. But nevertheless, we have always covered the most ground most effectively when we participated in structured data capture. We've allowed the evidence to lead the way. There is insufficient evidence. I will repeat that. There is insufficient evidence to make any statement about taking hydroxychloroquine for COVID-19 or its complications, and thus to advise monitoring or not, would be misdirected because the very premise is where this conversation needs to start and end. We don't yet have therapies. Many, many talented investigators are working diligently to launch immediate trials, including trials with hydroxychloroquine, to try to derive these answers. The trials will have short-term outcomes because the disease is so morbid, so we should know something. And I would implore everyone who's thinking about these things, find your nearest investigator, your nearest site, enroll patients quickly in trials. Let's work together to get the answers so we can help the most patients in the best possible way. Um, the take-home message for everyone listening to this 